Um, welcome to Proofreading in Errata, Mitigating Mistakes. Uh, I'm Doug Adams. I'm the librarian down here in Fort Worth, Texas. And joining me today uh, is Jeff Ryan. He's a freelance composer and the former composer in residence with the Vancouver Symphony. Um, before we get started, uh, a little announcement. This event is hosted by MOLA, an association of music performance librarians. Today's session is part of our virtual Vancouver conference, and we invite our viewers and members to go to our website for more information on upcoming sessions and resources. This webpage is open to the public, and you can follow hashtag virtualmola for the latest information. Um, well, today's session is going to be um, uh, Jeff uh, talking about uh, newer, newer works uh, and computer engraved editions, and I will be talking about um, older. And if I can get this to work, there we go. I'll be talking about uh, older editions and how we can find and, and avoid mistakes in works that are already in print. Um, and I think one bit of housekeeping, uh, Amy wants to remind me that if you are, if you have questions, please just kind of pop it into the chat feature uh, and we can probably do a question and answer at the end. So um, two tracks today. Um, a lot of mistakes in music can create a disaster. So today I'd like to look at proofreading through the framework of a disaster. Uh, emergency managers will often talk about disasters in four different phases. And if we look at a natural disaster, as an example, uh, like a flood after a hurricane, this will easily illustrate the points. Um, beforehand, you'll see a bunch of people rushing around, going to the store, buying bottled water and all kinds of things they don't need. Uh, during the event, you'll see TV images of uh, first responders pulling people out of high water. And afterwards, you'll see news reports of all the billions of dollars it takes to recover and rebuild. But the one thing you rarely talk about in a disaster is mitigation. And if we would ask the question, why do we keep building houses in a floodplain, we could possibly save ourselves a lot of time and money and aggravation. So mitigation is what we wanna talk about today as we wanna prevent any kind of musical disasters. Uh, before we do this, we need to define what is a musical disaster. Uh, librarians tend to think of errata in terms of wrong notes, that E should be an F sharp, or I'm missing a forte, and, or this should be a mezzo forte instead. But I think we need to broaden our concept of errata to include all the different elements of music. Uh, is there an adequate rehearsal system? Do the page turns work? Uh, are the transpositions or clefts appropriate for that instrument? And really most importantly, is the music of a, a legible size? Uh, is the font correct? Is the paper uh, appropriate to the size of the font? So I would say that anything that's gonna stop your rehearsal, waste time, or hinder any kind of music making should be considered a mistake. Uh, and how to respot a disaster? I would say use your personal experience and uh, how accurate is the publisher? Do you trust their work? And this is a very subjective thing. This is, uh, bear with me on this one. If there's any publishers watching, this is not an indictment. This is just something our folks in 1983 MOLA came up with just as a conversation piece. Um, so I think, uh, you know, what we kind of know today that Baron Ryder and Breitkopf and Herdel and Boozy and Hawks, you know, they put out some pretty good stuff. Uh, well, Ricordi, you know, if you've ever worked with the old Verdi operas, it's not so good. So this is kind of a way of thinking of older works and things that have been in print for hundreds of years. Uh, again, it's not gospel. It's just a, a way of uh, how, how you would think about a work. Uh, nowadays, it's all rather subjective because a lot of composers are self-published. Um, other ways to spot a disaster, uh, use MOLA as a guide, go into the website, search the forum for some clues. Are there long errata lists for a similar composer or a publisher? And um, most importantly, just call a friend, call a colleague. What do you know about this piece? Um, do a quick review of the parts if you're unsure. Just kind of thumb through. Are you seeing inconsistencies when you're doing bowing masters? You know, hold up a flute part next to another flute part. Uh, is one missing a bunch of tempo marks? Um, that's just a quick way to know if a part will have uh, some, some problems. 
And uh, importantly, in, in today's, in today's um, ever-changing world, you have to know some basics about how computer software, uh, the, the engraving software works. Uh, what can you mess up and how do you mess it up? And, and more importantly, how will the copyist make the mistakes using the computer? And at this point, this is where I'd like to stop sharing here and kick it over to Jeff to say a few words about how uh, composers and copyists can make, uh, can make some mistakes or what we should be looking for. Thanks, Doug. Uh, it's great to join you all today. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail right now uh, because I've got lots of examples for, for later. Um, I've been doing my own copying since uh, the mid-90s. Um, my, one of my work study jobs at the Cleveland Institute of Music was to learn Finale 2.6.3 and teach it to the other composers. So I've been, um, I've been doing that for a long time and my copying skills are a lot better than they were 25 years ago. One of the realities is that with each generation of composer, more and more of us are doing entirely our own copying with notation programs. And in fact, a lot of composers now, um, again, each new generation more, are even composing at the computer and using those programs. Um, there are a number of ways that mistakes can be made that are really simple to make. The reality is that um, none of us starts out knowing the intricacies of the programs. And because so many of us are doing it on our own, we learn along the way. I'm thinking in terms of you as orchestra librarian, where are you seeing this? It's often that you're doing student reading sessions or you've commissioned an emerging composer, uh, perhaps someone local. These are people who are very, very, very likely to be doing their own work and are really going to benefit from your feedback in terms of what kind of questions in the we find out what doesn't work because we don't learn this at university. I had the good fortune, whoops, I'm, are you still able to hear me? Yes, uh, I just got an unstable internet thing. Um, I had the good fortune um, 20 years ago of being an affiliate composer with the Toronto Speed. And one of the first things Gary Corin did was ask me to bring in some of my part work and sat down with me and said, this looks great. I would do this. And that helps me to become better. And then when I was composer in residence with the Vancouver Symphony uh, for several years, um, Manella Laxon took that again to another level and just said, this is great, but can you do this? Can you do this? Can you put the instrument name in the top? That sort of thing. Again, we don't learn that. So or orchestra librarians who know all of this detail are our greatest benefit to make our copy work better because most of us are not going to be with a professional publisher. We're not going to have the money to hire a copyist to do all of our parts. So never be shy about pointing out those things. And a bit later, I'll, I'll, I've made a score with a lot of mistakes in it so that you can see the kinds of things that I learned along the way. And I'll turn it back to Doug. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, before I kind of launch off into mitigation, uh, one kind of little quick story. Um, I had a phone call from uh, an anonymous library friend, a very, very experienced library friend. Um, and he went off on a rant. He said to me, look, you need to call those people up at Lux Music. They're always looking for suggestions of what to reprint and what to put on computer. Tell them that this Ponchielli Dance of the Hours is just awful, horrible piece of music. I spent hours correcting this thing. They should make a brand new set for this. Well, I typed up his notes and I sent them off to uh, the Luck family and uh, Amy King. And a couple weeks later, my friend called me back rather sheepishly and said, uh, well, your friends up at Lux got back to me and they said, you do know that Calmus actually sells a corrected version of that, don't you? Um, so I think that is a good, uh, let's see if I can get back to sharing. Pardon me here. Here we go. 
I think this is a good illustration of mitigation. Um, when it comes to proofreading older editions, my first piece of advice is um, don't do it. Don't, don't blindly start working. Uh, you need to do some basic research and save yourself a headache. I think you know, a lot of us librarians are busy. We have just a huge number of tasks. And we get into this mindset of just going from one task to another task. When it comes to proofreading and things that are very time consuming, we need to get out of this task oriented mindset. Stop, take a step back and consider what are some other options. When it comes to some of the older editions of music, finding a replacement may be better than proofreading. So uh, how could my friend have mitigated his problem? Well, research all the possible editions that are out there look for things that are newer corrected. An editor's name is usually a tip off that it's been worked on. Look for some better plates. Sometimes publishers will make changes or corrections to work but still list it under the same old catalog number. Um, and an important point here is don't assume critical means corrected. Uh, you'll often find that new and shiny edition can be full of errors. So before you commit to buying a new edition and working with it, do some homework first and see what you can find out. Um, where do you find um, some better options? Our usual suppliers in the States, we go through Educational Music or Lux and there's a few others. Um, check out the independent publishers. Uh, Lars Payne and Scores Reformed over in the UK. Uh, ever since Calmus closed up the corrected Newig and Clark McAllister editions are over at something called uh, Serenissima, I believe. Um, and don't forget to peruse your major publisher catalogs because, again, publishers don't sit on their hands. They're always coming out with new editions. Um, and Zinfonia has a very, very robust list of all the higher materials, which leads me to say you should probably at some time consider renting public domain works uh, because a lot of the new editions for the less popular public domain works are on hire only. So what you'll need to do is uh, balance the cost of the rental versus the cost of your labor. I mean, how many hours are you gonna spend correcting something? Uh, and what's the frequency that you're gonna perform this, this work, this problematic work? If it's gonna be a staple of your repertoire and your music director loves it, you may wanna correct the old set and keep it in your library. Otherwise, you know, find something better. Uh, and if you're unsure about a new edition, peruse the parts. Uh, the new digital tools like Encoda are starting to develop a pretty, pretty severely large library of things. Go, go take a look or call your publisher and just ask for a perusal. They're often very, very willing to help you out. Um, next, I'd like to take a look at three musical examples that fall into these categories. Uh, older editions that have just too many problems and are not worth the time correcting. Mismatched or what we call Frankenstein sets. And uh, think, and, subtle changes that have been made to place within an established edition. And I will need to do a new share here. And can everyone see the PDF? I hope so. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, and these, this is gonna be a quick example. Uh, similar to my, my friend, my anonymous friend who was looking at Ponchioli Dance of the Hours, uh, here is um, a little uh, Tchaikovsky tone poem. It, you know, the font looks pretty good, but you know, when you start getting into it, you realize, um, you know, it's a cello bass part all in one, on one part, and, and you flip through, and there are no good page turns. And, you know, I'm going through what, what I'm up to now. Uh, 17 pages, there are no good page turns. Um, so yes, you can spend time correcting this and all that, but at the end, you know, there are you know, 18 or 20 players at the uh, bottom end of your orchestra that are gonna have horrible parts to read from, and you're gonna have to do terrible things to correct page turns, and it's just not worth the time. So I would say look for something new and shiny at this point. And when I did the piece last, uh, I called up um, Ellen Marie Winfield and said, could you send me a perusal part for the Bright Cuff and Heritel edition that was published in 2000? She said, sure. And here it is. This is just an old string master. Um, and it was nice. It's like, yeah, that, that page turns work. Uh, I think I'm just going to go with this. And I, I saved myself a headache of having to correct it. Uh, yes, the new editions may have a problem or two, but nothing compared to what the old editions had. Um, the next example, I just had to go one uh, work over on my Tchaikovsky shelf. 
to Hamlet Overture. Um, again, the old Jurgensen parts um, don't look great, but it's not bad. You, know, you don't have cello bass all on the same book. It's still pretty workable. Uh, but when you realize that the quote matching score sold by Calmus um, is frozen, is actually a different edition. This is not Jurgensen. If you look closely, you'll see it, instead of having letters, it has numbers. And for me, that was a dead giveaway that this was something pulled from the complete uh, corrected um, Tchaikovsky editions created by the Soviets. So it's not, it's, it's the same piece of music, yes, but there's been a lot of editing that's gone on in here. So if I tried proofreading with this edition, I would be wasting a lot of time and, and, and just pulling my hair out. So if I want to use the old parts, I need to do something like find the old Jurgensen score. And if I went on IMSLP, I did find that old Jurgensen score. So there it is. Um, and just a quick musical example, I hope this is coming out. If I pull out a little highlighter here. Um, yeah, the Soviet score has some additional dynamics that the uh, the old Jurgensen score doesn't have, and oh, there's some uh, little editorial changes with tenuto marks. So again, you're going to be just wasting all kinds of time um, making, making one edition match another. That's not proofreading. That's just literally making something match something else. So I would advise, if, again, if you want to use the old parts, get the matching score. If your conductor wants the Soviet collected score, try to find a rental parts, you know, call up Brettkoff, they may have it. I think I've seen Elcor has something as well too. See what's available out there. Um, uh, my third example, which would be if you have uh, changes that are, have been made within an edition and that they may kind of sneak up on you. Um, I was preparing a new set of Grieg Pier Gint and just kind of in passing doing some bowings, I noticed first violin had some nice dynamics I we often kind of hear and, and imagine when we hear this piece. Uh, when I looked at second violin part, they didn't have those dynamics. And I'm thinking, well, why should that be? When I look at the score, it turns out seconds and everyone should have those dynamics, but they don't, it's not in the parts. Uh, I flipped through uh, seconds, viola, cello, bass. They were all missing those dynamics. Uh, first violin and score, was of the same printing, they had those dynamics, but the uh, other strings did not. So again, is this a case for proofreading? Well, no, for me, the correct answer is just go find the old parts. Um, and that's what I did. And so I pulled out the old parts and instead of having missing dynamics, you pull out the old parts and A, there's the, 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 the dynamics that you, that you need in the old part. So this for me is an example of, um, how you can, if you just pay attention to what's going on, the little context clues when you're preparing music, you can mitigate your mistakes. Um, and let's see, I can go back here. Uh, so uh, preparation, uh, the preparation phase of the disaster, what can we do to get ready for the proofread? Um, if you are gonna proceed with proofreading an older piece of music, I would really caution or uh, um, ask you to research and obtain as many score editions as possible, including piano reductions. Uh, Cross-referencing the other editions will help you with questionable uh, uh, note errors. Um, and remember, at university libraries, as well as some of the digital uploads like IMSLP or ENCODA, are good resources for editions that may be out of print or not really readily available. Uh, next. Make sure to budget your time wisely. Uh, how, how much time is it gonna take for a proofread? I mean, if you just start a project not knowing how, how long it's gonna take, that's a disaster. So correct a few pages, do some math. Uh, prioritize the type of errors you want to correct, especially in old music. You know, what's rehearsal stopping, what's minutia? Do you really want to spend hours and hours adding all those little tiny staccato dots into the Allegro section when no one really cares? Again, budget your time. Uh, you also need to decide am I going to be using the original parts? Or are there so many errors that I need to correct one master and then duplicate it? Again, you don't want to spend you know, hours and hours putting hundreds of corrections into multiple string books. Sometimes duplicating is better. 
uh, you should also decide, will you be using digital tools like Photoshop? Will the end result look significantly better? And is it worth taking the time to scan it and then reprint it? And always, always work from paper. If you are proofreading, especially with new computer music, if someone sent you something digitally and you need to proofread, don't, don't proofread, proofread on the computer screen. Always print it off and use the paper for that. Um, some little physical considerations, uh, nice big table, good light, get your tools organized. And uh, most importantly, uh, don't do any proofreading when musicians are in the building. You can't have any distractions. If you have distractions like second violins walking and asking for something, that will create more uh, disasters. So uh, the response phase for me, uh, doing the proofread, um, I've found the most accurate way to proofread is to compare score and part, looking for just one element at a time. And uh, I know G. Shermer AMP uh, writes this method into their style manual, uh, and apparently they find it useful for uh, proofreading as well. So um, it, we can break down the different elements uh, by the uh, PRDAMTX kind of business. Uh, pitches, rhythms, dynamic articulations are pretty uh, straightforward and uh, easily understood. And if I go over here, um, back to the, hopefully you can see the PDF. Um, yeah, extremities are a bit difficult to explain, but I think visually uh, the, the best way to explain extremities when you're looking for would be things that are outside of the staff. So if, if you decide to do a final check at the end, because uh, when you get busy looking within the staff, you sometimes miss things that, that cross over. Do the slur and ties make it over to the next staff line? Did this time change that we noticed in the proofread actually make it over to this side? Um, did the, the change here, the key change and time change actually make it down here? Again, these are kind of the extremities and this is a, a good, way, good thing to look for as well. Um, I, when, I, when I suggest looking for literally just one element at a time in proofreading, I get a lot of pushback from librarians saying, I'm way too busy, I, I just don't have time for this. Um, uh, and I would counter this by saying, well, in one sense, you already are proofreading one element at a time. You know, what happens when you buy a new set of parts and you inventory it? You're looking for the instrument label here. Is it really flute three or is it flute three doubling piccolo? You're already checking that. You're already looking at the title and the composer. And when you're done, uh, we often flip through to make sure each part is complete and the pagination is correct and all the page turns work. So in a sense, you've already started proofreading, but you just don't know it. Um, I think it's also good to have some priorities in proofreading too. Uh, make sure you've got the right number of measures. Um, I mean, that's just a really simple way to start. And if you do need to consolidate elements and if you don't really literally want to look at one thing at a time, I would say look for things above the staff because they're very easy to miss when you're proofreading a cello part. Sometimes the tempo indications um, or the rehearsal figures may be just a little bit too far away from the cello line in the score and you're going to miss it. So always, always look for things above the staff separately uh, so you can focus your attention on those things there. Um, again, if you want to combine, uh, then for look for things below the staff, dynamics and um, expressive marks. Um, and so when it comes time to actually getting to the meat of the work, all the pitches and the rhythms and the articulations, all the things that are, uh, that are very nicely packed within the staff, you don't have to shift your attention to looking for things above and below. So again, uh, looking for one thing at a time will will really uh, narrow your focus and, and hopefully you'll mitigate your risk of missing some errors when you're doing your proofread. Uh, and yeah, here's another example of extremities. Okay, excuse me, let me find a different screen here. Uh, recovery, uh, documenting errors and creating errata lists. Uh, and then just very quickly, I would say, um, Peruse your parts after performance, uh, fix and document any additional errors that may have been found by your players. 
Um, keep clear notes of the corrections you've made with your set of parts. Um, and this is an important thing we've not really discussed, but if you make a change to the full score, remember you're actually making an editorial decision. This, this isn't proofreading, you've actually stepped into the world of being a music editor. So you need to make a clear note about what editorial changes you've made. And again, this goes to mitigation. If you actually have a clear note of what editorial changes you've made, and if it's with your score, you're going to hopefully uh, avoid future confusion. Um, and this is kind of a silly example, but um, you know, I didn't necessarily agree with some editing done by Clark McAllister. And so we just said, well, we changed it. Here are the changes. And we just put a post-it note right up on front of the score. And it was just an easy, easy way to, uh, to address the changes that we made editorially. Um, and lastly, I would say, make sure to document your errors. Um, the MOLA errata forms are great and the new MOLA website is even better. Um, I think we'll probably have to do a whole session on that once the, the final little um, uh, web developer details are finished up. But, um, but yeah, there's a lot of interesting things that are going on there. Uh, and if there are any publishers watching, if you need access to our errata, please send me a note directly or through the, um, through the MOLA website and we can send you a link to a, an errata file. Um, and as always, if you find uh, corrections, don't just send it to MOLA. Uh, don't, uh, static lists aren't really good for anything. Make sure to send your corrections to the publisher. Start the dialogue with the publisher or the composer. Um, and uh, one, one quick note, Jeff and I were kind of joking about this the other day. Um, I think when you're working with some of the newer pieces too, we've, we're talking about ha what happens when a conductor starts to rewrite a piece and the, the composer uh, is there. And yeah, you need to be careful. And I would say, um, you know, make sure that whatever corrections are made from a stage are, are uh, sanctioned by the composer as well. We, we don't want to be putting out erroneous information um, just because a conductor thought it should be this way. Okay. Uh, before I hand this over to Jeff, I'd like to take a quick little commercial break and say, I um, want to remind everyone viewing at home that you can visit our website where you'll find information about additional sessions and resources as part of our virtual Vancouver conference. Additionally, if you'd like to support MOLA in future educational endeavors and resources, such as this session you're viewing today, simply go to our website and click the donate link at the top. It is through donations that we're able to support a wide variety of educational initiatives. So I'm going to stop sharing at this point and mute myself because you've been hearing me talk way too long. And I will pass this now over to Jeff. Thank you, Doug. Um, I'm going to be talking from my own experience as a composer who does his own copying and a composer who has worked with orchestras in working with student composers for student reading sessions. Um, hopefully some of the things that uh, I tell you, you will find uh, useful um, that I can share from my experience. Um, the way that I do copying and what I've learned along the way is not necessarily the way that everyone else does it. I know Greg Hamilton's here. He's a professional copyist. He has uh, his kind of house style, I would say. I have my house style. As more and more of us are doing our own work, we're each kind of developing slight variations for our own house styles. Um, so I, I say that because the pressure is on me because Greg's listening and he's probably gonna disagree with half of what I say. But uh, let me share a screen here. It's Absolutely true that um, in the last 20, 25 years, particularly 20 years, the notation programs and PDFs have completely revolutionized the way that we make our music available. Most of us are, are never going to be with uh, the conventional publishers. Uh, we're using Finale, we're using Sibelius, we're using Dorico, we're using MuseScore. Um, MuseScore is a free program if you if you haven't come across that. I have discovered um, kind of very early composers are using MuseScore because it's free. Uh, they're all pretty powerful. Um, 
But MuseScore, because it's free, I have found um, the students coming or I make a comment about something they've done and they say, well, I can't figure out how to do that in the program. Um, every program kind of has the general same approach, but small details within. I'm a Finale user. I've always been a Finale user. Uh, Sibelius, people tend to be leaving Sibelius and moving to Dorico is my experience. So I can't speak specifically to using those programs. Um, one thing to keep in mind too, if, if you're getting things from a publishing house, um, it's not unusual that, of course, they, they, they're hiring professional copyists like Greg. Um, they've got a department of copyists who work with these programs all the time and know all of the details. Um, even so, the score might be marked as a composer's facsimile. In Canada, certainly, I, I don't know what it's like in the States or in other countries, but in Canada, if you get a commissioning grant, the understanding is that the composer through that commissioning grant is delivering a performance ready score and the part copying is a separate, uh, a separate amount. Um, so often the composer is doing the score and might be um, handing that score over to a, a copyist to extract the parts. Um, but still the score that even the professional publishing house delivers might be that composer's facsimile. Um, but as time goes on, as you're working with more and more younger composers who are new into the, into the business, um, we're doing our own work, we're doing our own copying and our own part preparation. And that means that we all have very different levels of experience with the programs. And as I said earlier, any kind of feedback that you can give is going to be valuable in working with young composers in reading sessions, for example, at the Vancouver Symphony. Uh, we would have them submit a couple of parts early on so that we could have a look and we could make comments. The reality is that a lot of mistakes that might be in a specific part are going to be in most of the parts. So you really only have to look at a couple to make comments and then the, the full set is going to be better. Uh, some um, orchestras now in reading sessions, if they don't have a composer residence, actually do a, a, a feedback session with the music librarian, uh, with those composers that they're working with, uh, which is incredibly helpful. Sorry for the truck going by. So as I was just getting to, who does the part preparation? A lot of us are doing all of it ourselves. I do all of it myself. The advantages to me are that as the composer, I know the details of the piece better than anybody else. And doing the copying, doing the score, and doing the parts adds another layer of editing the piece. Um, maybe I've repeated a pattern from one spot into another spot, but I've um, mark the slurs differently, then I can catch that because I'm doing all of that work. I have absolute control over the appearance of the scores and the parts. Um, purely realistic, I get to keep whatever money there is for the part preparation. As I mentioned, a grant would cover the, um, the delivery of a performance ready score. The parts are separate. Um, most of us are going, if we're freelancers, uh, like I am, we're going from commission to commission. Hopefully there's a string of commissions and having the part preparation money also available um, is just helpful when you're a freelance composer. It also means that if I get a commission from an orchestra um, and they might come to me and say, this is our budget, it means that how to deal with the commissioner about copying fees. Um, that might be harder to do if I was using uh, another person as the copyist. So doing all the copying myself is a lot of flexibility. And in my experience, more and more and more of us are, are following that. Some composers use a copyist for the parts. As I said, you deliver that completed score and it's a finale score. You hand it a extract the parts, 
I have a friend who does this. Um, and she, for her, the advantage is that um, that professional copyist has more experience than she does with the notation programs. Um, that's always a hopeful thing. And I say that um, not entirely in jest, because sometimes um, and I, I have colleagues who started out um, earning money as they were building their careers by copying music for other composers. But they themselves were still young composers. So they don't have the same level of experience with the notation programs. And if you think hundreds of years ago, how composers learned about composing by writing out other composers' scores and parts, it's a similar kind of thing. But it does mean that um, even though they're, they're working on someone else's score, they're still learning the program along the way. So you're hoping that they, they have that uh, experience, but they're picking it up along the way. Um, my friend uh, also mentioned that for her, she's worried about questions in the rehearsals, which is always the issue. Having another outside set of eyes for her catches mistakes and it goes back to correct things that are in the score. Because with the notation program, unlike the old days with, with ink and vellum, where you copy the score and then you have to manually transfer everything to the part, whatever's in the score, it's extracted into the part. So if it's in the score, it's in the part. So if there's a mistake in the part, it's, it's also gonna be a mistake in the score. Some composers uh, use a copyist to prepare everything. This is totally anecdotal, just from asking around. It seems to me generally, this is a generational thing. Composers who are older, who, who've been around from the time where things were copied by hand, and uh, you just turn over your um, pencil score, they're accustomed to having someone else do that work uh, for them. Um, so I keep back to the, the more younger composers that your orchestras are working with, um, the less you're gonna see this, the more you're gonna see the composer doing his or her own uh, work entirely. In copying, as I said, zero questions is the goal. I don't think I've had a situation where there have been zero questions in rehearsals, um, but when I'm in a rehearsal, whatever questions come up, I make notes and I go back and correct them in the score and in the parts afterwards so that I'm keeping um, my edition up to date. And uh, unlike one of the um, mitigation techniques that Doug spoke about, with new work, you don't have another edition to go to. You really only have the composer to go back to to ask the question, um, or the publisher, if it's with a publisher house, but then the publisher house has to go back to the composer and ask. Um, I would say never be afraid to ask that question of those people. When I'm preparing material, uh, my rule of thumb is that the conductor needs to see how it sounds and the player needs to see how it's played. Um, that means for me, an orchestra score is a C score. Um, so that you can see, the connector can see exactly what the sounding pitches are. Um, it means that I'm writing harmonics in strings at the sounding pitch, whether they're natural or um, artificial. Um, I know that I think more in the States, uh, some publishing houses and uh, individual composers prefer to do transposed scores. Um, I think that some of that is because the the notation programs are designed to work more easily when it's a transposed score, when you, in the score, write artificial harmonics as the way that they're played with the fourth and the, the diamond note head. Um, so I, I, I see kind of more of that um, because the programs kind of push you in that direction. Um, regardless, uh, the player needs to see how it's played. Obviously, that may sometimes include the requirement that you add in a little fingering. Um, if it's an unusual fingering in a woodwind instrument, for example, you don't need that in the score, um, but you need that in the part. So um, the steps that I go through 
is to prepare as clean and accurate a score as possible. Um, when I show you a finale example, we can talk about how everything gets entered. But Doug mentioned about always working from paper, and that's how I work as well. It's not just that I, I write everything, I write a pencil score and then enter it into the computer. Um, but after that score is done, the first draft, I print it out and I proofread it from the paper copy. And that is, in my experience, the best way to do it because you just see it as the totality of the page. Uh, you can see everything more clearly for me. And go back, make those changes, get the score as clean as possible. And all of the mistakes that have come up along the way in my career that I now know to watch for, um, I watch for those in the score. So what I'm finding now is that as I know those things in advance and prepare for them in advance, they are less and less showing up as mistakes in the parts that I have to go back to. I have less to correct in the parts. Then what I do is I take that clean and accurate as possible score file, I duplicate it in a part preparation, and I make global changes for the parts. Um, such as reducing the size of rehearsal letters, um, changing, uh, marking in um, harmonics in the way that they get played, so that that's how it'll show up in the part. Um, and then I extract the parts into separate files. Lots of composers use, and copyists, use linked parts. Um, we'll look at how that works uh, in the example that I've got. Um, I, I don't use them because there are some things that you can't change in the part without changing the score. And I, I need those in some cases to be a little bit different because of the conductor sees it, how it sounds, player sees it, how it's played. Um, but a lot of people use linked parts and, and it can be quite powerful and it's great for making sure that things you correct in the parts, end up back in the score. But for me, I, I format uh, each part individually. One of the things about linked parts is that you can't look at multiple parts at the same time. Uh, um, so I will start with the flute one part. I start at the top of the score. It generally takes me a while because it takes a little time to get the feel of what the layout's going to be and where the page turns are generally going to end up. Once you get flute one, flute two is a little easier. Oboe one is a little easier because the woodwinds often do kind of similar things at similar times. So the layout kind of ends up being similar. And I can have flute one and a flute two open at the same time and have a look at them and compare and it makes it go faster for me. Um, violin one generally takes a long time because the strings are, as you know, so busy. Um, but once violin one gets settled and you get the feel of that, the other strings go more easily. I print, I don't proofread on the screen, I print them, read through the parts as if I were a player. I, I think that's, um, there, there's, there's a lot to be said for the method that Doug talked about. Um, and there's certainly times that I will go through and make sure all the rehearsal letters are there. They're showing up that the last measure number is the number that it's supposed to be. And I'll do that for every part, but more, I catch more mistakes when I read through as a player reading through. And that's when I find a lot of, of the little errors that I then go back to the score and correct. Um, my process is not necessarily the same as everyone else's, but that's one process that I have found out um, works for me. As I mentioned, the amount of experience that individual copies have really varies. The programs are all quite powerful, but we never start out knowing them, uh, knowing all the details, and there's generally a pretty big learning curve. For that reason, most composers will start out with default settings. And a lot of the default settings are quite good as starting places. I mentioned that they may look good to the composer, but they're not always satisfactory. This is one of the Kind of pitfalls that as composers we can fall into and that is that the the notation programs look great they look published and when when you know we're starting out in our careers and we punch something in and it just looks so great 
we tend not to look at it necessarily as closely as we need to and look at all of those details because it already looks really good. So I, that's why I say always give, don't be afraid to give feedback to composers, especially younger composers, because if no one points out these issues, um, we'll just keep using the, the defaults. You can adjust in the programs what the defaults are, but if composers don't take the time to figure that out and no one says that there's a problem, they'll just keep, keep going the quickest route to the, to the finish line, which is using those uh, defaults. When I have occasionally taught orchestration at, at university, um, I devote one class to part preparation and I bring in, um, you know, some of my own parts. Ta -da! And, um, and I hand out the MOLA guidelines. I know you're all cheering about that right now. I can't hear you, but uh, you're cheering. Um, because if a composer doesn't know about the MOLA guidelines, um, composers need to know about the MOLA guidelines. Those are really fantastically useful um, for getting sizes right and all kinds of details. Um, I think, yeah, that's, we're gonna stop there. And I'm gonna share now um, a finale file. So I'm just gonna stop sharing and share something different. Now I mentioned that I don't use linked parts and I don't use the defaults, but what I, I tried to approach this example as the way a younger composer who's still perhaps relatively new and is maybe someone that you're doing a, a student reading session with who's providing music, how that person might um, start the work. So I set up this score with um, the orchestra default in my version of Finale. And when you're setting it up, you can specify what the instruments are it will automatically put them in order. It will automatically give them a starting clef. You choose the time signature and you can choose how many um, measures it is and so on. As a default, Finale makes a lot of the decisions for you and we'll look at some of those in page view. But in terms of the process of entering the notes, it's very much a horizontal experience. So for the, for the first flute part, for example, you enter the notes and the way that I enter notes, there's different ways to do it, but I have a, a keyboard that I attach to my computer and I hold down the pitch and I press a number for the duration. And so it's a lot of this. So it goes pretty quickly, but you do horizontally the notes and then you, um, you space everything and there are presets that you can use for spacing. Um, you always have to go through and respace and adjust the presets because they're never quite nice enough. Then you go through and you put in all the slurs and all the articulations and the dynamics. And then when you get everything done, I might do a family, do all the woodwinds and do all of those across and then do all the brass. Then you add the tempo markings, tempo changes, rehearsal letters, things that are uh, above the staff, things that are in the extremities. And then you go to page view. That was called scroll view because it just scrolls along to the end. In page view, it looks like this. Now, a lot of these are defaults. All of this is defaults. You can change all of this. One thing that Finale decides is based on the number of staves that you have and the size of the paper that you've specified. This is ledger size, tabloid size paper for a full score. It decides what percentage reduction is required to make all of that fit on the page. Um, you can also see that it's decided the amount of space that's between each staff. It's nice if there's more space here. Uh, you might want a little more space even between the families, the woodwinds and the brass and percussion. Um, these are easy to do, but if you just stick with the default, you're gonna have things that are crowding up. What that also means is that if you make a little more space here, you may find that you need to change the percentage reduction 
from what the default is. A lot of composers who don't necessarily know that you can change that here uh, won't know to make those changes and will kind of leave it at the default. Again, knowing you knowing that these things are all adjustable is going to help um, with a composer who doesn't realize that, uh, oh, I, I need to make this bigger and I actually can make this bigger. Another thing that gets decided um, is where the measure numbers are and the page numbers. You can see here the measure number is there. That's not so clear right now because of another problem. It's there. We can go back and change that. And in fact, in my orchestral scores, I don't like to have the measure number there. I like to have it in a box at the bottom of every single measure so that the conductor can always find very, very quickly what measure number um, is being asked for for a rehearsal start. So that can be changed, but this is the default. The other thing is you can see here that Finale has decided what the margins are as a default. They can be changed, but you can see that this is way, way, way too close to the margin, to the edge of the page, and that these pages two, three, are too close to the top. They can all be moved down. I can move that down a certain number of spaces to move that down. Um, but it is, a, it is a manual thing. You have to go in. If you haven't adjusted what the default is, you have to go through page by page and do that. It's entirely possible. But a composer who looks at that and thinks, well, that looks fantastic, um, doesn't necessarily take the time to go through and make that change. Um, and other things. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's a template. So over time, composers will learn to adjust the, um, the default or create their own orchestra template that they're always going to use that's going to have a lot of these things fixed. But if you just jump into the program, it's so easy that the program will do this for you that you don't have to think about these things. Um, but, the, but the fact is that ultimately you do have to think about these things. So it is possible to think about these things and adjust those things. Um, but you have to um, sometimes remind people. So I'm going to move over to another a piece where I've entered some music. I've kind of pulled this in from um, an existing piece, just copied some music in, so you can see some of the things that, that come up. One of the things is, I mentioned how I enter where I hold down a, a key and I hit the duration. That means that there are certain uh, default pitch choices that um, Finale will make. And here's an example of that. The first pitch here is an E flat. I then hit an E natural. So it assumes that it's an E natural because that, that's a logical thing in, in this case. I need to actually physically go in and change that to an F sharp. Obviously that fixes uh, some of the space requirements, um, but I do have to be careful to go through and make those enharmonic changes. You, because the E natural is a default, you could very well see a score where it goes back and forth like that. And that doesn't entirely make sense and you don't need to be using up that much space. Um, there was another one further on. The black notes default to certain pitches, C sharp and D flat, default to D flat. F sharp, G flat, default to F sharp. So you have to go through and make those changes. The other thing, another thing you have to watch for, and you want to change that to maybe an F flat to be different. 
you also need to watch for cautionary accidentals because I have an F flat there. I need an F natural there. That's not, finale is not gonna do that automatically. So someone has to go through and actually request for that accidental to show up. That's gonna be a common thing that you're gonna find in parts that, that someone didn't realize they had to take the time to do that. Um, another thing is that you'll see, let me get rid of that, is that super easy to add a slur, but there are defaults in the amount of um, arc that you have in a slur. Often, especially for a longer slur, it'll come down too far and you'll wanna be moving that up so that you're not taking up so much vertical space. That's something to watch for, that's a manual thing. Again, there's a default in terms of the arc, um, but they're completely adjustable and you're, it's gonna be a cleaner score if it is adjustable. Not everyone realizes that taking the time to do that is a really good thing. So let's imagine that I've gone through and I've done all of this. I don't think I made other mistakes in the scroll view. So let's go here. So Finale will decide for you, for the composer, what the layout on the page is gonna be. These margins were set, and it's calculating based on all of the space that's required horizontally, how many can go into that amount of space on each page. So here's a few things that are super common, uh, things that need to be cleaned up that people often don't realize need to be cleaned up. When a slur crosses a page, it's gonna look like that. And on the next page, it looks like that. You actually have to go through, pull the edge over a little bit, pull that up a little bit, and do that. It's gonna make a cleaner score, and then you don't have collisions. You notice that the slur and the, um, the crescendo collided. Uh, another thing is there's the default spacing between the staves and we've got collisions here. Collisions are the biggest thing that can happen and there are very simple ways to fix that. All I need to do is I want both of these staves to move down. So I'll take both of them um, and I need to do this. I'm gonna lock these uh, four staves together so that when I make this change, it doesn't change everything. So I need to move that down. Now, maybe you paid close attention and you noticed that that pianissimo moved down as well. That's the pianissimo for the viola part but it got attached, because they were close together in scroll view, it got attached to the cello part. So it needs to be attached up here, and I found that mistake simply by moving that down. You would also find that mistake by looking at the part, and we'll see how that shows up in a few minutes. Another thing that Finale decides for you So let's assume you're going through and you're fixing all of these slurs. Um, here's another thing to watch out for. I have, a, you can show it here. Whoops. The trombones have a mute in and then they have to cover it and then slowly uncover it. So there's an arrow. Of course you want that arrow to move right across to the open mark. But when that crosses a page, you get this little arrowhead that, that sticks over. I personally don't want that. I want that arrowhead to end up over here. So I would have to go through, that's measure five, six, seven, eight. I'd go back to scroll view. I'm 
whoops, I would grab this, make sure that that attaches to the end, and then I get the arrow there. That to me is, is cleaner, but you'll see that it creates a problem in the part uh, if we use link parts. Another thing that finale decides, page five. I mentioned earlier how it decides how much horizontal space it needs. It happens that the oboe two part has some um, alternate fingerings. It has like a, a, a flattened E natural in it going back and forth uh, between the E flat. I have to add that little arrowhead as an accident, as, as a, a little articulation thing. That means that this actually needs to be more spaced out. Now, maybe I saw that in scroll view, but Finale has decided because it doesn't know about the space required for that, that it can fit these four measures onto this staff. That all looks fine down, down at the bottom, but this is a problem. So I need to move that measure to the next page and have it spread out. Now it may mean that if I had a slightly smaller reduction, it might have worked. Um, and often what you'll find, now that I say that out loud, that composers, because the power of these, um, these programs is that you can make things as big or as small as you like, that a composer will think, well, if I make this smaller, I can, I can get more measures on a page. And there's a point at which you've made it too small. And the composer is gonna look at that and think it still looks great. But the conductor is gonna look at that and say, that's too small. A composer needs to be made aware to think about that. So I would find a way to spread this out. And sometimes it means the music is a little more spread out, but you can see here that these arrows now are really clear. It's very obvious. Now this is way too tight. So I maybe think I need to move two measures away. That works. That all looks nice. Um, and I've also gone through and I've adjusted every single measure already. So here, let's just try. Let's see what happens when I move one measure. Okay. Not good there. So I'm going to do that. So there's a lot of power to move things around. And that is one of the great things that's different from hand copying is that you don't have to plan out the end of the, of the, of the page. You don't have to plan out how many measures you can fit. You can just move them and you can try it and you can see and you can move it back if you need to move it back. That's one of the great things about these programs. Um, but you need to know, you need to think in terms of, can I see everything? Um, obviously, this is an issue, and those need to be adjusted so that you have no collisions. Um, this, is that going to work? This is obviously not really the end of the piece. Um, but that pretty much works. I could make this measure a little smaller. And update the layout so that that's smaller. I could make this longer. And in fact, I'm going to need to because there are little gliss lines here. And that's finale has decided based on its spacing that that is all that is needed. It is not, in fact, all that is needed. So I'm going to need to make some adjustments. Maybe this measure is going to need to move over. So there's a lot of organization to make the, uh, to make the score look as good as it can. Then at the final level, I'm putting in rehearsal letters. I'm putting in the tempo markings. I'm putting in tempo adjustments. And I'm getting the score as clean as I can, 
printing it out, proofreading it, going back, making those, those um, corrections. And then I'm creating the linked parts. Now I've already created the linked parts for these. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's very simple to do. You just do generate parts and you can specify which ones you want. I've already done it. And there they are. Now, one of the, the things that I find challenging with link parts is that when I go to the flute one part, you're not going to be able to see the score to compare. You're going to have to go back and forth. But let's have a look what the flute one part looks like. So you can see everything that's in the score is here in terms of the notes, in terms of the slurs, and so on. Now, because the amount of space, remember we had to move this slur up because of the amount of space that this takes up, which is a lot less than it did in the score. Nice to just move that up a little bit so that everything's kind of clear. The position of the rehearsal letter is the position that it was in the score. Some aspects in the linked parts are always linked to the score. And if you change them in the part, they will change in the score. A few things are linked until you break the link and a few things are never linked. Watch what happens when I move this A because this A is in a terrible spot right now. I move it here. It changes color, which I mean, for me drives me mad, but you would wanna move that uh, closer to that measure so that it's super clear. I would actually want to make that a tiny bit smaller because it's a, it's a little bit big for my taste. Um, but another thing that would need to happen is you it's spacing these evenly and adjustments need to be made so that you don't have collisions. So one thing is I would move these down so they're a little closer. And I would think about the, the spacing. Um, because you, you, you want to have like a full line at the end. Um, but you can play around with this. If, if a composer hands you a part that's got this, I mean, yeah, the player's going to be able to read it, but it's very elegant. And elegance is one of my watchwords. So I might, well, I might actually see if I can do that. That works very nicely. So I would see, I would just move these around so that it would, I'd have a full line there. I could do this and that, and that, and that, and that, and that, and just see how that spacing out goes. So that, one of the things that I try to aim for is that the, the player can read across at more or less the same speed. This isn't, isn't perfect yet, but I'm just showing you how they can be moved around. Um, so there's some, some things to watch for here. Because I split this, I have to do this so that it's really clear and it's important that the end go past the end so that it's very clear to the player that that slur continues. Uh, I would be playing with this format for a bit longer, um, but I can see that the rehearsal letters are all there. Um, the enharmonic changes that I made in the score are, of course, there. Um, this is an opportunity where I find out whether I've missed um, cautionary accidentals. Because it's one thing to look at all of the music in the entire score and look for cautionary accidentals. It's another when you can just look at that one line in isolation and those things pop out. You can find those things much more quickly and then go back to the score and do them. Let's see what flute two looks like. So similar issues, moving these, adjusting those slurs. Um, then I sit down and I look at the rehearsal letters and I'm noticing there is no rehearsal letter C. What's wrong? I go back to the score. Rehearsal letter C is there. 
The reason why this rehearsal letter is not showing up is because I didn't put it in through a rehearsal letter default. I put it through as just a general expression. It's attached to the Flute One staff, which is why it showed up there. It's not attached to any of the others. So I need to take that out. I need to go to the rehearsal marks, which is a, a, a default that it will automatically sequence them. And, and there it is. And when I go now to the part, there it is. I have to move it, but there it is. You can also see that the writ is there, the uh, tempo is there. I've just moved them down so they've changed color, but what's missing is the little dotted line. And that's because it was done as one of these, they're called smart shapes, which are the crescendos and the slurs and all of those things. Um, and those don't carry over to the parts. You have to do them um, as um, the same way that you did rehearsal letters, basically, so that they carry over. So that's an easy thing. Uh, it's an easy mistake to make. It's an easy mistake to fix, but it's an easy mistake to miss when you're proofreading. Um, let's quickly look at a couple of other parts. Remember I said that my score was a C score. The default in Finale is that it does the transposition for me. But that means that I need to go through and make sure that I'm happy with all of the enharmonic changes. And you have to be careful that the way that you change it um, is, uh, is not going to affect the score. Um, but the transposition is there. Transpositions are also another spot where you absolutely need to uh, watch for cautionary accidentals. Now notice that there are two measures rest here in the clarinet part. Because of the rehearsal letter default, it automatically split that. So you don't get the little multi-measure rest of two with a two above. Um, it automatically splits it for you. There will be occasions if this C, which was entered in, in, the, uh, in an incorrect way, um, that it won't break the multi-measure rest and then your rehearsal letters will disappear. We're gonna see an example of, of something like that uh, in another part. So this is one where you're gonna need to show an F natural there and there. Um, here's an issue. We've got the tempo because the, uh, I'm just going to hope that my connection stabilizes there. We have the tempo, but we don't have the writ. Why don't we have the writ? It's because, let me go to the score. We don't have the writ. because this measure and this measure are considered the same. In order for that writ to show up, we have to actually request that that multi-measure rest gets broken. And when we do that, hopefully, it's now split. And now the writ is there. We still have the issue, of course, with the dotted line. Again, it's a simple thing to miss. I have, I had the experience in an orchestra rehearsal once in a piece that had been played many times by different orchestras where the conductor said, let's in rehearsal, let's take it from letter L and the trombones did this and said, we don't have a letter L. What measure number is that? And that's me sitting in the, in the house cringing like, what, how's that possible? But the L came in the middle of a multi-measure rest and it was entered in a way that I needed to actually go in and split that and force it to split the rest so that they all showed up. Um, so when I went home, that got fixed, as you can imagine. Um, let's have, I, I'm cognizant of the time. Oh my God, I better be cognizant, cognizant of the time. Um, let yep. me just 
Yeah, hi, Jeff. Yeah. I was just going to say, if we could, uh, we're about quarter past, if and uh, yep. a few more examples, just kind of wrap it up, and we can maybe take a few questions then. Yep. Let me just show you um, one more thing in the violin two part. I didn't realize I had so many, many mistakes. This is another thing uh, along the line of, of caution accidentals. It's just missing some notifications. Here, this is to be easy. Obviously, this needs total respacing to make this work. But here, the copyist, who was probably the composer, has forgotten to mark that this is now unison. It's easy, especially if there's been a number of measures rest after a particular, um, you know, a mute or pizzicato or divisi. Uh, if there's a lot of space in between in particular, it's easy to forget to mark in that that's you or that it's um, arco or that the mute is off or things like that. Um, again, we don't necessarily notice those um, until we see it as a line and we're reading it as a player. Um, but the whole thing is to read as a player. So those are, some of those mistakes are mistakes that you see in older music that Doug's already talked about. Um, but some of these mistakes are um, things that come up as a result of the quirks of the notation programs, which are incredibly powerful, but still require some um, um, adjustments by the, the individual copyist to make it really, really clean. Um, and I'm gonna stop there because uh, I've talked for quite a bit. You can tell that I get excited about this. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, and while you're catching your breath, I'll let you kind of just look at the group chat real quick. Uh, Greg Hamilton, of course, had a few comments. Um, and if you have questions or comments you'd like to make, just raise your hand. We can unmute you and uh, do all that. Um, and uh, while, while we're considering this, uh, one thing uh, Jeff had said earlier, uh, one big disaster you can kind of mitigate is uh, uh, managers, uh, symphony managers don't always think of the copyist fee when they're talking about a commission. They get so excited about commissioning a piece, either a, a real piece of music or an education piece, they often forget who's going to pay the copyist and is the, is the composer going to be expected to do the copy work. So um, if I think, I'm sure you've heard it many, many times at uh, many, many conferences, always beat it into your um, your uh, manager's heads. If you're going to be commissioning something, you need to talk about the money for their copyist as well. Um, I and that's the part about living downstairs in the library. We're not always privy to the conversations. The the contract is inked. Uh, they've uh, six months has gone by, and um, and then yeah, you've got a disaster because no one's talked about it. So uh, bring it up there periodically. So. Um, any questions or comments here? I don't see anyone uh, flagging or raising hands. Um, I can say that it's, it's really great to have a professional copyist like Greg here as well, mm -hmm. who's offering other, uh, other comments and other opinions, um, because we all, have our, we all know our own little ways around programs and ways that we like things to look. Um, so, and there's one of the wonderful things about the programs is that you can um, really do those detailed refinements um, to, uh, to make it look exactly the way you want. I never use the, the defaults and the third on my own because I have um, a default. I have my own designed default uh, blank score that I use. Um, so some of the setup that you saw in the example I gave um, are more likely the kinds of things you're going to see with a younger composer who's kind of perhaps a little more entry level and is starting with the, the defaults. Okay, um, well if we don't have any, uh, any comments or questions here, I just wanted to say uh, thank you, thank you so much to Jeff for joining us today um, and a huge thanks to Mola for hosting the event and to the MOLA Board of Directors for making this event possible. Uh, thanks again for taking the time to join us today for this presentation and have a good day. <laughs>